Okay, so what are we going to work on today? We're going to continue with our discussion of the respiratory system. So yesterday you guys were kind of working on your own. You watched a little documentary on the respiratory system. We're going to go into more detail about the structures of the respiratory system and a little bit about how they function. And then in the second half of today in block two, we're going to talk about some illnesses of the respiratory system. So just, just like we did with the digestive system, we're going to talk about some ways that the respiratory system can go wrong and be non-functional essentially okay so when you guys come back this is your last day by the way of this course for this block you're going to go to your course number two starting tomorrow so um on the day you come back which is uh i'm not 100 percent sure off the top of my head we can look in the calendar but the day you come back we're going to be covering the circulatory system and then on the last day uh which would be the second day back you guys are, are going to do the dissection with me. So uh, I, I think I guess the people from um, cohort A will be in here at that time, but I will, I'm going to stream it. So we're going to go through and do a fetal pig dissection. We're going to look at all three of these systems in a pig so you can like see what they look you're, like. That, you're going to do that when the other class is here? Yeah. That's going to be so funny. I bet they're going to be like, <laughs> it's a little, it's a little gross. Like it smells a little bit. Let me investigate how much time we have towards the end. But if I have time for it, then yes. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, so we're gonna do that dissection on the last day, and then we're gonna have a similar research project. I'm not 100% sure the details of that are gonna be, but there's gonna be a, a short research project at the end of this unit as well. Um, which will be something body system related. Uh, I'll get back to you. Uh, where was I going with this? Okay, so let's talk about what, we're, what we got to do today. So first of all, um, normally I get you to watch these like sort of like little side videos after the lesson portion, but I'm going to reverse it this time because I actually want to talk a little bit about these videos during the lesson, and they're both they're both pretty cool. Um, so I've got two little videos here. In total, the runtime for these is about 22 minutes. So I'm going to come back to you guys at home in a roughly 22, 25 minutes to give you a chance to watch these. And in class here, we're going to watch these together. So I'm going to throw them up on the screen here. Um, but the basic thrust here of these videos, um, the first one talks a little bit about energy and respiration. So like I said, we're talking about the respiratory system, getting oxygen into your body. And the whole point of bringing oxygen in is so you can do a chemical reaction and get energy for your body, okay? So the first video here talks a little bit about that energy process. It talks a little bit about ATP, which is the main energy molecule for the body, and like what the purpose of that is, okay? So here, we're, the first part here is we're gonna talk about why you actually need to breathe. Why are you breathing? What's the purpose of it, okay, from a, bio, from a biochemical perspective? So I'm going I'm to get you guys to watch this. Like I said, in the room, we'll watch this together. And then the second part here is, I, I love this video. This is um, an example of what happens when you stop, essentially stop breathing. What happens when you don't take in enough oxygen? So this video discusses this in like a little bit of a roundabout way. Um, you've seen this before? So this, it talks a little bit about um, why you're supposed to put your mask on right away when uh, there's a depressurization when you're in an airplane. Okay, and, then the, and we're going to talk a little bit about how pressure affects your ability to take in oxygen and when we go through the note together. But here, essentially, they're going, this person is actually going to demonstrate this. So he, he gets put in a chamber where they reduce the pressure, and then he has to do like some tasks, uh, some like logic, and they're simple things like put this shape in this hole and things like that um, in order to demonstrate what you, it's like when your brain doesn't get enough oxygen. What happens when your cells don't get enough? What does that look like? Okay, it's really cool, actually. I've, uh, I don't think I've ever seen this done with a real person before. Yes? Would it damage your cells? It depends on how long they go without oxygen. So this guy is only going low oxygen for 30 seconds, a minute, maybe a couple minutes max. Long term, let's say that you're climbing Everest and you go above the death zone. So the death zone is right around 7,500 uh, feet, which I don't know what that is in meters, so I'd have to look it up. It's when you're near the, near the top of Everest, so maybe like uh, a day's hike from the top, okay? When you go above that level on Everest, there's actually not enough oxygen in the air to properly give yourselves enough to survive long term. So if you stay above that death zone for a couple days, you start getting brain damage. 
You just don't get enough oxygen going to your cells anymore to keep them alive. So yes, if you're, if you're long-term with low oxygen, it's going to potentially be causing brain damage. Almost everybody who climbs Everest does it with oxygen. Almost every single person. It is possible to climb Everest without supplemental oxygen, but it's extremely difficult. So like often people say that you have to take 30 breaths per step um, if you're above the death zone without supplemental oxygen. So 30 breaths per step is like a, I mean, that's ridiculous. That's extremely difficult to actually climb a mountain like that. So, so almost nobody does it, but it is physically possible. People have done it before, but um, not recommended. Anyway, like I said, I'm going to give you an opportunity to see these two videos. They play into what we're going to discuss afterwards, and I just want to make sure you guys have seen this. So again, at home, I'm going to give you about 20-ish, uh, 25 minutes. I'll set a time on here, and then we'll come back. I'm going to watch these with the people in, in the room. Okay, so before we move on, does anybody have any questions about any of that stuff? Fairly straightforward. What we're going to talk about today is essentially just how you get that O2 in. Okay, a little bit about gas exchange, what's happening to actually like get the oxygen into your body, like at the, um, the microscopic level, and then a little bit about like the larger structure. So yesterday you guys read about uh, the basic anatomy of the respiratory system. We're going to review it quickly today as well. Um, so hopefully everybody's back here from watching the videos. I think we took a little bit longer than you probably. Um, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So just as a heads up to talk about like um, briefly what we're going to be doing today. Um, we're going to do this little note together um, where we're, like I said, going to do a little review of the structures of the re respiratory system and how that stuff works. Um, the notes right uh, at that link right there that says here, you can also find it on the side here. Uh, it's right underneath day 13. It says day 13 respiratory system. That's the note. So you're going to want to get a copy of that and open that in Cami. I'll give people a second to do that. There's a little video that you're going to watch afterwards and a short textbook reading. It's a chapter on um, sort of like things that can go wrong and things that can negatively affect the respiratory system. And there's a couple questions from the text. And then in the afternoon, we're going to, like I said, we're going to spend some time together talking about some illnesses of the respiratory system, some ways it can go wrong. I also have uh, a little um, medical case study. I really like this YouTube channel. <laughs> Uh, my wife watches it all the time. She's a family physician, so she always is interested in seeing like medical case studies. But I think they're really cool. So this one is about somebody who uh, tried to eat some Tide Pods. Uh, I guess for they were trying to make like some kind of Instagram video or something, and um, accidentally aspirated a little bit of it in, into their lungs. Um, and it talks about like what are like the medical repercussions of doing that. I can't remember if this person died or not. I think they might have. Uh, but anyway. It talks a, a lot about sort of like the chemistry of that and like how they diagnose the problem and like what physically happened to this person. It's it's not good. Yes. Um, have you ever bought a brand new pair of shoes and in the shoes there are those like bags that make the shoe smell? Like, like, Silica? Yeah. Those little white things. Silica? Yeah. yeah. Do you eat those? Do you die? Uh, it's not a great idea to eat them. Yeah. <laughs> They're not I edible. Someone tell me if you eat them you have <sighs> I don't know if silica is that toxic. I mean, I wouldn't eat them, yeah. but they, they absorb moisture. That's the purpose of them, right? It's yeah. to prevent mold from growing in the shoes, like while they're being transported. They, like, absorb the water in them? That's right. Yeah, they're moisture absorbent. Like they, they, I don't know what they would do if you ingested it. It would absorb a little bit of water. It might turn into a gel in your digestive system. It might cause a blockage. I'm not sure exactly what happens to silica if you eat it. They, it says on all the packets not to eat it, yeah. <laughs> but I've never really investigated what the actual effect of that is on a person. That's an interesting question. I would recommend it. Don't eat them. <laughs> anyway, so that's where we're headed for today. Um, uh, hope, do you guys have the note up? Yeah? Okay, great. So I'm going to switch over to that right now. Let's, let's talk a little bit about these structures in detail. So um, the first part of what you watch, that video, uh, um, that Kurtzgesagt video, was all about the why are you breathing? Like, what's the purpose of bringing oxygen into your body? And the short answer here is that you need it for cellular respiration. Okay, so respiration at the cellular level is when your mitochondria take oxygen. Do I actually have the... Uh, no, I didn't write down the 
formula for it anywhere. Let's do it right here. Do you guys know the formula for respiration? This would have been something that you would have done in grade 10, probably. Grade 10 science. I almost take a shot of this. Do you know it? It isn't? It isn't for anybody? Is Cammy working? For me, it is. I tested it yesterday, it was working fine. Shoot, give me one sec. Hold on one sec, guys. Let's see if we can fix that. Because I, I, I was, uh, I checked last night before I did this, because I was like, oh man, it never fixed it for me. And it was working, so I think it's... This one just might be So the idea behind the Secure Network is we can make sure that only students and teachers are actually going to use it. Uh, and that's to prevent some type of third party from trying to access the account that's on the school network. So anything that requires data transfer on the school network. Uh, so for example, all of our smart yes, systems are like that or on the Big 
a way yeah, now. What is your problem? Oh, I don't want to buy dollars. That's what you're going to So I think what's happening is we're trying to access this thing through two images that are not able to work this way. And because of that, it's actually not letting you access it. It's like, you know, I am a whole bunch of these images. Yeah, that's why. Is everybody else able to access candy right now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's definitely going to be the one right now. I'm going to distract the computer. Let's. I don't have it at all. Yeah, we'll try restarting your computer. If that doesn't work, we're going to have to figure out something else real quick. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, probably. So you want to make a copy for just for yourself? Oh, for this entire thing? Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay, so then you go to that copy where it is and you can find the docs. Well, it would be in docs, so we're in the drive. Yeah, I don't want to do that. So, yeah, save it in a location. In drive. And then and then once you save, you go to that location, and then I'll check it out. Why don't you look down to one of them? That's one of the reasons why this doesn't work out. Yeah, I have a feeling that that might be one of the reasons why some things came out right. There are any balls back over the last half hour. Yeah, I think that's a win. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, we're going to be smart. Yeah, go up and look. Yeah, go up. I'm going to be smart. You know what? Well, I think you actually, uh, there, she there she goes, there she goes. Now you got it here. Oh, now I'm going to do it. Yep. First crush. 
Sorry, guys. It's good? Yeah? Sorry about that, we just had to do a little uh, tech problem solving here. Okay, respiration. So respiration, the opposite of photosynthesis. I'm just gonna write this down at this point. What you need in order for to respire in your cells is you need oxygen, so that's the main thing. And you need an energy rich molecule to get the energy from. Primarily, what molecule is that? What do you guys have to consume in order to get energy? Well, oxygen is the, the one of the parts that you're going to res you're going to breathe in. The food part, which is primarily what molecule? Glucose. glucose. Okay, so you can write glucose. I'm going to write uh, C6 H12O6. You might remember that from last year. That's glucose. So that's what your cells need in order to get energy. They need glucose and oxygen, and then the product of this is you're going to get some energy. Now, we, they mentioned in the video the format of that energy. So that energy actually is in the form of a molecule called ATP, which we're going to talk about in a second. That's the energy and intermediate molecule that all living cells use. They all use a form of ATP to store their energy temporarily. And then you're also going to produce some products of respiration that you have to get rid of, which are what? What do you produce when you respire? You have to breathe this stuff out. This is the gas you need to remove, carbon dioxide. Okay, so you got to get rid of that. This is the product you don't want. Okay, you got to get rid of that. And you're also going to produce some water in the process. So the water just stays dissolved in your blood, although you do respire a little bit of it out when you breathe. Okay, so if you, you hopefully remember from last year, and we are going to talk about this in our plants unit, that this is the opposite of photosynthesis, right? So photosynthesis is you need these things, energy, carbon dioxide, and water. The energy is from the sun. And you're going to run this reaction backwards, and you're going to produce oxygen and sugar. So photosynthesis is the exact opposite of this process. So that's the basics. That's cellular respiration. All of your cells have to do this in order to make their energy. They need to do it constantly, as mentioned in the first video. And if they stop doing it for a couple minutes, they start to die. Some cells are a lot more sensitive to no oxygen than others. So neurons are the most sensitive. Those are your nerve cells. So your brain, your peripheral nerves, those things are the most sensitive to low oxygen. If they're without oxygen for a couple minutes, then they just start straight dying. A lot of other cells in your system, for example, muscle cells, are very good at operating on low oxygen. So for example, if you are riding a bike or going for a run and you're breathing as hard as you can, okay, you're getting as much oxygen in the system as you can, you're transporting as much into your muscles as you can, but you are going to use up, if you're working really hard, all of the oxygen that's available at the muscle. And you start going into a low oxygen state. And that's when you start producing lactic acid. You might have talked about this in your phys ed class. That's when there isn't enough oxygen available to make enough energy to keep the process going. And your muscle cells are very well equipped to deal with that, that low oxygen. In fact, that probably has happened to you many times. You've gone running 
and you've run more than your ability to produce oxygen. You start getting cramped up as the lactic acid builds up in your muscles. You've probably done this before. That's fine. So that doesn't cause cell death for your muscles. They're specifically adapted to be able to operate in a low oxygen state, as long as you keep breathing. So if you keep breathing, you can basically undo that process and start replenishing everything in your cells over the long term. That's not a big deal. In fact, if you take a belt or something like that, you guys may have heard of a tourniquet before, and you cut off the blood supply to your leg, okay? So you put a really tight band around your leg and you cut off the blood supply. It's mostly muscle down there. You can leave your leg without blood for a couple hours. I don't recommend this, by the way. <laughs> Lots of metabolites and stuff build up in your leg and it's very painful. But those cells will probably not die. You're going to end up getting a lot of pain and metabolites building up and stuff. And when you release it, it can be dangerous because those metabolites go systemic and then they can cause a lot of inflammation. But you probably won't die. Your leg isn't going to die probably if it doesn't get oxygen for a couple hours. If you cut off your brain like that, your brain will be dead in two minutes. Okay, you will be totally dead, unrecoverable after a couple of minutes without oxygen. So again, some cells are much more sensitive to that process than others. You don't want to cut your the blood off to your brain. So, and I'm sure you guys are already aware of this. So it doesn't take very long for your, your brain to be deprived of oxygen before you start dying. So, um, in fact, you might have seen this if anybody like watches UFC or whatever. If you've seen someone be choked in UFC, when they're, you're getting choked out, you're not actually um, losing, it's not the air that's the problem. It's not that you can't breathe. It's that it cuts off the blood supply to your brain. You're, you're actually pinching the, the blood vessels that are going to the brain and because there's no blood getting pumped to your brain, that's, what, that's what's causing people to go unconscious. So it's not actually because you're not breathing. But you don't actually die from that, you just go unconscious. Assuming that you let go. <laughs> if somebody let go, lets go when you go unconscious, then yes, you, you don't die. But if somebody doesn't let go when you go unconscious, you absolutely can die from that. So, uh, not, I mean, obviously it's regulated well in UFC, but there are... Um, Previous to that, there have been incidents of people dying from asphyxiation. So it is possible for it to happen. Um, okay, so then again, the, really what we're talking about here is how do you get these things? Okay, these are the, what we need in order to keep our cells alive. So the first part is the food part, right? That's the glucose. Well, I should say it's the second part, second part in, here, in this formula here. Uh, so in order to get that, you got to eat. That's what we were talking about in the previous system, right? That's your digestive system. We have that system to get that molecule in the food part, okay? And the respiratory system is all about getting the second part, that's this part, into the system. Oh, and I mean, obviously also removing the waste product, which is carbon dioxide. So your respiratory system is a dual purpose. Get O2 in, get CO2, get the waste product out. In order to do that, we need to do what's called ventilation. So ventilation is the process of actually bringing new air into your lungs. You would just call it breathing, okay? That's the ventilation component. We're gonna talk about why it's important to continuously ventilate in a second, but essentially you wanna keep all the air at the highest concentration, the oxygen at the highest concentration inside your lungs so that it goes into your blood. If you stop breathing, the concentration of oxygen is gonna go down and then it's not going to want to go into your blood anymore, causing you to become asphyxiated, okay? Become hypoxic. And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about the gas exchange at two different locations. So the two locations where we're having. So I'll get to that in a second. Um, so you may not be aware of this, but you're breathing about 17,000 to 29,000 times a day. That's a lot. That's crazy. So there is a lot of ventilation happening you're breathing maybe 25 times a minute. Question? Um, do you know how much carbon, I mean, oxygen a tree makes, an average tree? Uh, it, would it would greatly depend on the size of the tree and the species of tree. Um, can I get back to you on that question? That's a really interesting question. The question, by the way, was um, how much oxygen does a tree make? Um, let me get back to you. Uh, I, I used to watch a really cool documentary with, uh, with a different class of my other senior bio class where somebody was put into like a sealed chamber, just them and a certain number of plants that they calculated would be creating the same amount of oxygen as that person would need to survive. It was really interesting to see how many plants it was. 
for smaller plants, it's like 30 or 40 small plants, assuming they're receiving sunlight, um, that are required to sustain a single person. I don't know what it is for trees, though. So I'd, I'd have to investigate that. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, so what does that mean? That's like 500 million breaths in your lifetime. <laughs> okay, so we're like a lot of breaths, right? You got to do a lot of ventilating. You got to do it continuously in order to stay alive. And what we are breathing in, what we're actually pulling into our bodies is mostly nitrogen. So what you're breathing right now is almost completely inert nitrogen gas, which is not absorbed by your body and has no biological effect whatsoever. It's mostly nitrogen. It's about 21% oxygen. That's the part we want. A uh, little tiny bit of argon, about 1%, which again is not absorbed. It's a noble gas. It doesn't take part in chemical reactions, but it makes up about a percent of the atmosphere. And then a teeny tiny percent of carbon dioxide. That percent, by the way, is going up a little bit. That's uh, last year, you hopefully talked a little bit about climate change. So that percentage that's in our atmosphere is actually going up, but not by a huge amount. What's that? It's about 0.04 percent. Yep. And it, it, when it, it's gone up maybe about 0.01 percent in the last 100 years. So it doesn't sound like very much. That's actually a huge amount of carbon dioxide gas, but it's gone up about 0.01 percent in about 100 years. Another 0.01 percent would be extremely dangerous uh, ecologically, but, but uh, I'll leave that for a different uh, discussion about climate change. But um, in terms of is that going to be problematic for people to breathe? No. So carbon dioxide has to get somewhere around 3% in, in the atmosphere before it starts becoming toxic for humans. So it obviously has to get a lot, a lot higher for it to physically kill you. That's not really the concern with climate change. It's not that CO2 is going to physically kill you, but it is going up. Okay, so the idea here is what we're trying to do is take advantage of this. 21% oxygen, that's what we need. And the whole purpose here is to build this molecule. This is adenosine triphosphate. You might recognize this adenine right here. That's one of the nitrogenous bases from DNA, right? Do you guys remember that? A and T, adenine and thymine pair up with each other, and guanine and cytosine pair up with each other. We talked about this earlier in the course. Uh, so adenine is also used in this molecule. It's one of the most important biological molecules, uh, spe specifically because it's used to make ATP. So that attached to a little sugar, a ribose sugar, and then with three phosphates on the end, okay? So this is a adenosine triphosphate, notice the three, so one, two, three, triphosphate. That third phosphate, this one on the end, you can cut off. So how it works is when you put that extra phosphate group on the end, then it holds energy. And anytime you wanna use energy, all of the different parts of your cell, the Golgi, the little proteins in your cell, the whatever, you name it, ribosomes, what they do is they shave off that third phosphate, and when they do that, it gives them energy to do their task, okay? So it's all about putting that one last phosphate onto an ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and making it into a triphosphate. So what you can think of this as is almost like, what's a good way to um, explain this? Imagine that you wanted to do a bunch of work um, by using a water wheel, okay? You got a water wheel and everything runs on this water wheel. What the ATP is, is the water. So with all of these processes, you're taking some water and putting it into a reservoir up high. You're grabbing a, a glass of water and putting it in the reservoir and grabbing a glass of water and putting it in the reservoir. Okay, that's the ATP. And as you let the water run down into the lower reservoir and turn your water wheel, that ATP is going, or going from ATP with three phosphates and turning into ADP. This isn't coming out on the camera over here. And turning into ADP, which is two phosphates, okay? It's like it's running downhill. It wants to become adenosine diphosphate. And every time it does, it gives a little energy to its surroundings. So what you're doing in your cell is trying to build up this energy reserve, this area of water up here in your reservoir. You're trying to fill, fill your reservoir of ATP. So that it can run out and then pour out into your lower reservoir down here, which is ADP. That's adenosine diphosphate. 
So that's only with two phosphates on it. Okay, and then in between here, you've got your water wheel. So the water wheel, oh my goodness, that's hideous. Let's see if I can draw some shapes here. Is that going to work? Nope, that didn't do it. That is an ugly circle. Okay, whatever. This is a, this is meant to be a water wheel. You can insert shapes from the left side. You can? Yeah. Where's that at? I thought you could too. I don't see the option for that. Give me, give me one sec, guys. I actually think that. Uh, is this gonna crash? Don't crash. Um. Oh no! Don't crash! Don't crash! Oh, I didn't like that. <laughs> Oh, recovery, recovery. Oh, geez. You never know what you're going to get with this thing. Okay, one sec, guys. I have to, there is an option here for shapes. Where the heck is it? Here? 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 No. <laughs> I'm struggling. Oh, it's different on the iPad. It looks, it is different. No. How do I turn the shapes on? Oh, jeez. Okay, what, what's that, guys? <sighs> Shape detection. Shape detection turned on. Might just be going so slow that it's not working. Let's try this again. I think I, I think it actually was just crashing because it was going too slow. One sec. There we go. Okay, that's kind of a circle. I've drawn better circles. Oh, that's hideous. Let, let's let's try that again. I'm I'm being way too much of a perfectionist about this. Sorry. Here, there we go. That's a little bit better. Okay, we got a water wheel here. And this is. Okay, so that water wheel represents like all the different work that you got to do in your cells. So you want to go from ATP to ADP. So again, what's the importance of this molecule? Come on. Stores energy. Or... cell. Is that ATP or ATO? That's supposed to be ATP, sorry. <laughs> when you do respiration, So you use that ATP for all cell tests. So that reserve of ATP lasts for about, did you, did you guys catch what it said in the uh, video? How long ATP lasts in your cells if you stop breathing? That's how many you make every day. It depends on the cell type. For muscles, it's actually closer to just a couple seconds. So you only actually have a few oh, yeah, seconds yeah. of reserve in muscle. So it depends 
um, on, on the type of cell, but I'm going to say the, the reserve lasts for between 10 seconds and maybe a couple minutes. Maybe I'll give an average here, about 15 seconds. So the thing is, if you stop providing oxygen to this system and stop, or stop providing sugar, that would be the other issue that you could run into, in about 15 seconds, the cell is going to stop working. So the interesting thing about this, you can actually see, you guys ever heard of rigor mortis before? Rick and Morty. <laughs> Not Rick and Morty, rigor, rigor mortis. <laughs> This, the idea that like a body gets like locked up in a certain position after you die. Has anybody heard of this? No, oh, nobody watches like nobody watches CSI. Nobody watches CSI anymore. Do. Or you don't watch CSI. So they talk about that stuff on CSI. Your cells require ATP in order to actually relax your muscle cells. In order to get the muscle fibers to let go, you require ATP. So what happens when you die? is after a certain number of hours when all of the ATP in your body is expended, your muscles get locked up in a specific position. They stop and you become very stiff. That's called rigor mortis. And they can use that sometimes to help establish when somebody died, how long ago they died, because it actually takes a certain amount of time for rigor mortis to set in on a person. And then eventually it goes away um, because the muscle fibers start to break down just due to basically just decomposing. Uh, and then you stop being in rigor. But um, so that, that happens when you get to, when you die, uh, is that the, the muscles lock up. All right, so you got to get oxygen in there. That's the point of this, right? There's two main places where this happens. In general, what you're trying to do is ventilate. So you're trying to get oxygen in. That's the O2 part. And you're trying to get CO2 out of your lungs. That's the purpose for the ventilation, right? When you breathe out, you're breathing out some CO2. When you're breathing in, you're breathing in fresh oxygen. The actual amount of CO2 that you breathe out is fairly low. So you don't actually breathe out that much CO2, but um, it's certainly an increase from uh, environmental CO2. If you were to be breathing in CO2 uh, regularly at more than the amount that is coming out of your lungs, so that would be about 3%, all of a sudden, when you breathe out, breathe in, you would be taking in CO2 as opposed to removing CO2. And that's why it becomes toxic somewhere around 3%. So you're only actually breathing out about 3% CO2, um, which is not, not a huge, huge amount. And, and a little bit more if you're holding your breath. So yesterday, you guys talked a little bit about the anatomy. I'm going to mention it again today. But alveoli, is that term sounding familiar to you? <laughs> These are the little sacs in your lungs. Um, the end points when you breathe in, if you follow all the little tubes down, you get to these tiny little sacs, and they are about one cell thick. So the one cell thick part is actually really important. It's got to be very thin here. This is only one single cell thick, so that you can allow gas to go across that membrane into your blood. And there's lots of blood supply on the other side in your bloodstream. So the key here is you have to keep O2 in here high. So inside here, we need O2 to be high. That is the purpose of ventilating, keeping O2 in here high. If O2 in, the, in this region that's in your alveoli is high, and then the blood coming from your body in here, O2 is low, right? This is the, the, this is the blood where the oxygen has been used up on the other side. Okay, it's passing by. So if you have something with a high concentration on this side and low concentration on this side, which way is it going to want to flow? This is going back now to what we talked about in the cell biology unit. Do you guys remember this? We talked about diffusion. How do things flow if you have an area of high concentration and an area of low concentration? No idea? How do things flow when you have an area of high concentration and an area of low concentration? Which direction are they going to flow? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so imagine you're in a room. Imagine you're in a room and somebody increases the concentration of something in the corner of the room, okay, of the gas. Let's say you sprayed some perfume in that corner. Which way is that high concentration of perfume going to want to diffuse? Is it going to go into the corner 
or is it going to want to go from high concentration in the corner to low concentration in the room? It wants to go from high to low, right? That's the principle of diffusion, okay? We, again, this is from the last uh, two, two units ago. We talked about this, but things always want to move just due to the laws of physics from high concentration to low concentration. So if you have high O2 in the cell or in the alveoli and low O2 in your blood, then naturally you're going to get movement of O2 going in this direction. O2 is going to want to naturally diffuse across the membrane. Does that make sense? It's high in the alveoli and low in the blood, and so just due to that, just the fact that it's high on one side and low on the other, it just naturally goes into the blood. Okay? I'm just going to mention this above here. Oxygen will diffuse into the blood at the alveoli. Moving high concentration to low. And that's just diffusion. That's the principle of diffusion. Things are always going to move from high concentration into low co to low concentration. If you drop some food coloring in the corner of a glass of water. It's not just going to sit in the corner of the glass of water. If you leave it over time, it's going to spread out and go from high concentration to low concentration and spread out through the, of the entire container. Okay, It'll just naturally happen due to the laws of physics. You guys did a lab on this in the, the first block too, a little computer animated lab, and maybe, maybe you don't remember it. Anyway, this is a really important concept in biology. So the reason this is so important is because what happens to the concentration of oxygen inside the alveoli if you stop breathing? What happens to the concentration? How concentrated it is in the alveoli? How much oxygen is in there? Imagine that the oxygen, remember, is going into the blood. So it's, if you actually think about it as like water, here you have water going into the blood here. What's going to happen to the amount of water you have in here if you just leave that? It's going to do what? It'll just stay there? So if this was water, if oxygen was water, and the water was leaking into the blood, and you stop adding more water to the alveoli, what's going to happen to the... It's going to run out, right? The concentration is going to go down. If that concentration gets low enough, then all of a sudden you're going to lose this concentration gradient, where there's more on one side than there is on the other, and then oxygen is going to stop going into your blood. Okay, so that's what happens when you stop breathing. When you stop breathing, you break this concentration gradient and oxygen doesn't want to go into your blood anymore. So your blood oxygen concentration goes down. That's what happened to the guy in the video. Okay, they removed the oxygen from the room and so his concentration of blood in his uh, of oxygen in his alveoli went down and he stopped sending oxygen into his blood and his oxygen blood content, his blood oxygen content went down and his cells stopped functioning. Okay, he was start, stopped uh, being able to talk. So, so that that that's why you've got to ventilate. You got to keep the concentration of oxygen in there high. Conversely, you have to do the same thing with CO2. So imagine that this blood in this blood vessel is coming from all of the cells in your body. Okay. So what what is going to be the CO2 concentration in this blood? This is coming from all of the cells after your cells have used it. Is it going to have a high concentration or a low concentration of CO2? What was the question? Okay, this blood in this blood vessel right here is coming from all of the different cells in your body. Is it going to have a high amount of CO2 or a low amount of CO2? High because what are all the cells in your body doing? What are they producing? Going back to this respiration formula up here. What are they, what are they all making? And, more importantly, what's the other product here? What's the other product? Uh, carbon, dioxide. <laughs> carbon dioxide. They're all making carbon dioxide, right, through respiration. So if you look in the blood that's coming from all of those cells that's in this, um, in this blood vessel right here, it's going to be high in CO2. So here, the CO2 concentration is high. 
Okay, so it's high in the blood vessel. And then if you look on the alveoli side, remember that you are constantly removing CO2 from in here, from the alveoli, right? Because you're breathing. So what's the concentration of CO2 going to be inside there that you're constantly removing? Is it going to be high or is it going to be low? It's going to be low, right? So you're going to have low CO2 inside your alveoli. So you've got high CO2 in the blood and low in the alveoli. Which way is CO2 going to move in this case? What, what's this? This is blood down here. Yeah, exactly. From the blood to the alveoli, right? So in this case, you're going to get lots of movement of CO2 going the other way, going this way into the alveoli. That's also important. If you stop breathing, the CO2 is going to start building up in the alveoli, and you're going to break this concentration gradient. So CO2 is, in, is not going to want to go out of your blood, OK? This one is especially important because hopefully you guys did the reading yesterday. Maybe you didn't. But your body cannot detect low oxygen. Um, if you go, Going back to that video, um, oh, I can't remember that guy's name anymore. Dustin. Dustin, thank you. Uh, when Dustin had hypoxia, you get symptoms of hypoxia, but it doesn't make you want to breathe when you have low oxygen because your cells can't actually detect low oxygen. It doesn't initiate more breathing because you have no actual physical way from on a physiological level of detecting low oxygen. What you do have the ability to detect is high CO2. So if you have high CO2 in your blood, that is what it actually is telling you to breathe more. So when you hold your breath, and you can try this now if you'd like, what ends up happening when you hold your breath is that the CO2 starts to build up in your blood because you're not ventilating it, okay? And then the CO2 stops flowing out of your blood. You, what do you feel like when you hold your breath? What is the feeling that you get? Like you can't breathe. Like you can't breathe, and what does it force you to do? Like to breathe, to open your mouth and breathe, right? So you feel this compulsion to breathe. The compulsion to breathe is actually coming from the fact that the CO2 is building up in your blood. It actually initiates a reflex that forces you to breathe. So that's all based on CO2 signaling. Your body can detect when your CO2 is high, and it initiates um, breathing. It forces you to breathe. You can circumvent this. Interesting fact. You can circumvent this. So if you take a whole bunch of extra breaths, hyperventilate, and then you hold your breath, what you've actually done is removed all of the CO2 from your lungs. Okay, so you've made the concentration of CO2 in your lungs extremely low. So what happens then is it takes a long time for you to move enough CO2 into your lungs to start telling your body it's time to breathe, okay, to break this process because you've removed so much extra CO2 from your lungs. You haven't increased the amount of oxygen. The amount of oxygen that's in your blood is always near 100% saturation. So you don't get extra oxygen when you hyperventilate, but you do remove extra CO2. So what ends up happening if you hold your breath then is you may not get the signal to breathe. You can hold your breath until you go unconscious, basically, because you don't get that feeling that you have to breathe. And so that's why when you go scuba diving, not when you go scuba diving, when you go snorkeling, you're not supposed to take a lot of deep breaths before you go underwater. <laughs> because if you do that, you won't feel like you have to breathe necessarily, but you will run out of oxygen and potentially go unconscious while you're underwater, which is extremely dangerous. Yes? Do you know why when you're scuba diving, you need to talk to the surface slow? Yes. So that, that is related to um, what they were talking about in, in the video, the idea that when you reduce the pressure, the gases inside your body expand, right? Do you remember when they reduced the pressure and then all of a sudden like they, they, their like guts were filled yeah. with air? The nitrogen that's in your blood, when you go down, 
it takes the nitrogen that's at atmospheric pressure and compresses it to a small, small, small space, a low volume. And that actually gets dissolved into your blood when you, when you go down, diving. If you come up really fast, what ends up happening is that the, blood, the nitrogen that's in your blood actually comes out of your blood in bubbles. So you get bubbles of nitrogen forming inside of your blood and it can block your blood vessels and cause all kinds of crazy problems in your blood vessels if you come up too fast. If you come up nice and slow, as that nitrogen comes out in your blood, you can exhale it and it, 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 like, it's, it is slowly removed. But if you come up really fast, that's where you get nitrogen narcosis and you can potentially, the band system, it can be fatal. So, so it's, it's quite dangerous to surface very quickly. Sorry. Uh, the question there was, um, why can you not surface quickly while you're scuba diving? So it, 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 is, it is related to this concept of pressure a little bit. Okay, so there's one area of gas exchange. And, and again, the, the gas exchange is happening just because of diffusion. Diffusion is what's causing the gases to move back and forth here. Gas exchange also happens at your cells. So you have... Um, you, you've you put all this O2 into your blood, you've removed the CO2, now you're going to pump that blood to your cells, that's where your heart is for, okay? And when it actually gets to your cells, you need to get the O2 into your cells, okay, out of the blood. So this would be like the end product, where you want to get the oxygen to go to, all right? So you can imagine then these, these cells, your, your body's cells, are using up oxygen all the time, right? They're, they're doing cellular respirations. So they're using up their oxygen. So what's the concentration of oxygen going to be like inside of your cells? You're using it up all of the time. If you can think about this as sort of like a car engine, uh, and this, the, the O2 is the gas, okay? If you're using up all of the gas all the time, what's the concentration of gas going to be inside of the cell? It's going to be low, right? Because you're using it up. So inside of the cell, you have low O2. That's just, you naturally have low O2 because you're using it up. You've been pumping O2 into your blood, right? That's what you're doing in your lungs. So what's the concentration of O2 in your blood? High. Okay, so you have high O2 in your blood. So if you have high O2 in your blood and low O2 in your cells, which direction is the oxygen going to want to move when it gets to your cells? Where does it want to go? This is due to diffusion, right? Up, which is in, into what? Into the cell, okay? So again, just naturally due to diffusion, you're going to get oxygen moving into your cells. That's the way oxygen naturally wants to move. So this doesn't require any energy. As long as you keep breathing, oxygen will still go into your cells, which keeps you alive, okay? Because it goes from high to low concentration. As soon as you stop breathing, you break this, right? Then you won't have high O2 in your blood anymore, and your cells will stop taking up oxygen, and they will potentially die. Okay, so again, this is the reason why we need to keep ventilating. The same thing is true for CO2. Your cells are constantly making CO2, right? They're building, they're making CO2 because they're doing respiration. So what would the concentration of CO2 be in your cells if you're constantly making it? It's high, right? So you have high CO2 in your cells, and the blood is constantly removing CO2 so you're going to have low CO2 in your blood because you're getting rid of it at your lungs, right? That's the whole point. So which way is CO2 going to want to move then? Towards the cell? Into the cell? It's, it's into the blood, right? It's going to want to move away. So the exact opposite, no problem, the exact opposite thing is happening with CO2. CO2 is going to want to move into the blood from your cells, again, just naturally due to diffusion. So diffusion is controlling this entire process, and you keep the diffusion going as long as you keep breathing. As long as you keep breathing, all of this works, okay? The moment you stop breathing, you start breaking this system, this diffusion system, and all the way down to the cellular level, you stop getting oxygen and stop removing CO2 when you stop breathing, which is going to cause you to become unconscious very quickly. Okay, so that's the importance of breathing. That's why we care about this. We need to keep breathing to stay alive, okay? All animals do.
What we're going to do now is talk a little bit more about the structures that are involved. You guys read about this yesterday, I hope. Uh, but I'm going to do a quick little review of your respiratory system. This is going to be especially important in the second block when we talk about um, where some illnesses can occur in the respiratory system because they are illnesses of these things, these physical structures, okay? What happens when you break these structures, essentially, and they don't function properly anymore? Okay, so again, we, we just mentioned this, but the idea here that the circulatory system and the respiratory system together are what are delivering oxygen to your cells and removing CO2 from your cells. Circulation, we're going to talk about the first day that you come back. So I'm not going to get into a ton of detail on the circulatory part here, but I am going to talk about the respiratory part, just the oxygen, getting the oxygen in. So we have some key structures that are necessary in order for this system to work, okay? All mammals have this in some form or another. Most organisms, most animals have this in some form or another, not just mammals, but most animals. So first of all, you need to have a way to get gas in to your blood. So in order to do that, we need a thin membrane. The thin membrane for humans and for most mammals is the alveoli. Okay, so this is the alveoli part. Alveoli are only one cell thick. This is the barrier where gas is actually going to go into your blood and out of your blood. CO2 in and CO2 out. So you got to have that thin membrane. Not every animal has lungs. So a fish, for example, is going to have gills. It's going to pass water over top of its version of alve alveoli. It doesn't actually have alveoli, but it has something similar, a single cell membrane where gas can move across due to diffusion. Okay, and every animal is going to have some version of this. So the membrane has got to be thin to allow gas to go across it. If, you, if the alveoli was too thick, it would just be too difficult to get, get gas across it. The second part is that same membrane has to have a very large surface area. So you've got to have lots of alveoli. You have hundreds of thousands of alveoli in your lungs. So they're very small. Um, they're almost microscopic in size. Uh, I used to have an actual lung that I brought in, but it's kind of falling apart and it's gross, so I'm going to leave the lung out for now. Um, it's, uh, it, it, I think it's started to go off a little bit, so it's, it's, been, it's a cow lung, but uh, you can kind of see the alveoli. They're very tiny. Each alveoli is kind of like about the size of a breadcrumb, a little, little bit smaller than a breadcrumb, okay? So that's the kind of size that we're talking about here. At the ends of your, all of the passageways of your lungs, there are hundreds of thousands of these tiny little breadcrumb sized chambers. Those are your alveoli. Okay, that's where the actual gas exchange is taking place. And they're spherical. They're in the shape of a sphere, which just means that they have a lot of surface area. And that's what you need. You need a surface for the gas to go across. You got to have a blood supply. So now you need to have an actual, uh, basically like a delivery train to carry this stuff around the body. All animals have some form of circulation that gets the gases to the cells. And then lastly, you gotta have some way to pass gas across the membrane. So you have to have a muscle system for ventilation. You guys have a diaphragm, we'll talk about that briefly and how that ventilation works, but you have a muscle system that pulls air in and pushes air out. If you remove that, you die. Um, you guys may have uh, heard probably a lot recently about the uh, opioid epidemic. This is like a big thing going on right now. There's lots of people that are dying from opioid overdoses. When you die from an opioid overdose, really what you're dying from is suffocation. So you're preventing uh, your ventilation mechanism from working. You're paralyzing your ventilation mechanism and you stop breathing. So the real problem here is that it's just it's preventing you from breathing. Uh, uh, clinically? Yeah. They're used, oh, sorry, the question was what are opioids used for? For pain relief. So we, we do use them for pain relief. Opioids, uh, I don't have too much time to get into this, but they used to be the go-to uh, clinical treatment for pain because it's really, when you think about it, a miracle. Um, before the 1900s, uh, we didn't really have anything to treat pain. So if you were getting surgery, uh, you just just be quiet. <laughs> you, we, we can't really make you unconscious very well. Uh, you, we can use ether, but it doesn't work very well. And you are going to experience the pain of being cut open, uh, which is 
very painful. <laughs> so uh, when we first discovered opioids, the fact that we could actually inhibit pain in people, it, it was a miracle. It's, it's amazing. And when you hear about things in like the early 1900s, about like people having like cocaine in their uh, cough medicine and things like that, cocaine was one of the first uh, opioids that was used as a pain reliever. Um, it's a stimulant too, but uh, it, it, can, it can be used for pain relief purposes. Anyway, uh, it was a miracle at the time. But the problem, obviously, is that they're extremely addictive. So we have better pain management, clinical pain, pain management techniques now to use than opioids. We only use them as a last resort, generally, because of how addictive they are. But even up to 10 years ago, we were prescribing them boundlessly uh, all, for all kinds of things. We don't really do that anymore. Okay, let's talk about the structures. Some of this stuff you're obviously going to be familiar with. Okay, I, I'm assuming you know where your mouth is located. Okay, so this is the beginning of the chain. So your mouth and your nasal passage, typically you don't breathe through your mouth, you can breathe through your mouth, but most of the time when you're respiring, you're breathing through your nose. And that is actually really handy uh, because it has a bunch of mucosal folds in your nasal passages up there and hair. So if you think about it, it's got a sticky surface up there that catches particles that you're breathing in, dust and all kinds of things, which stick to the mucus in your nose. And the hairs inside of your nose also act as a filtration mechanism. They filter the air that you're breathing. Not the teeny, teeny, tiny particles, the like three micron particles, um, which are uh, well, really quite dangerous to inhale all the time. So um, those ones we can't really filter out. But the bigger particles we generally filter out in the upper respiratory tract in the nose. Okay, so awesome. That works really well. It's got some mucus in there. It catches stuff uh, and it filters out a lot of the big particles. The other nice thing about the nose is that it moisturizes the air. It adds a bunch of water to the air that you're breathing in. Your, your alveoli, which are the end of the line here, the tiny little dots at the end of the line here, they need to be wet in order to work. In order for that gas exchange to work across the membrane, they have to be kept moist. So you need to moisten the air that's coming in because if you dry your alveoli out, you stop diffusing gas and it can be potentially fatal. So um, so that's one of the other things that the nasal passage does. It, it, it starts to moisten the air that comes in. Uh, the back of your throat, which is called the pharynx, is just um, something that the air passes by on the way down. It doesn't really have any functional purpose in terms of uh, ventilation other than to be a passageway. And then we talked about this with regards to the digestive system. The epiglottis is important because it prevents you from swallowing food into your respiratory system. So it's just a flap and it covers your respiratory system whenever you swallow. Okay, all of that up there is what's known as the upper respiratory tract. So the upper respiratory tract is the pharynx, the nasal passage, and then right below that, there's just the first part here of your trachea, which is your larynx, and that's where your voice box is located. I am gonna get you to watch a quick little video. This is the beginning of the second block um, where someone actually gets a camera put into the respiratory system and you can follow it all the way down. They get the person to go and talk and stuff so you can see what their voice box actually looks like while they're talking. You see it already? <laughs> yeah, it is kind of gross. But, uh, but you can see in there what the structures actually look like on the inside. It's pretty cool. So there's like a sort of like a little flap. Wait, can't you use like a, like you can't actually see the like a tool to help you? You can. You can. Now, if you have no vocal cords at all, that tool doesn't actually work. But it does work if you have damaged vocal cords or you have very low ability to use your vocal cords. It's kind of it kind of amplifies the vibrations that you're making in your yeah, vocal so cords. It's kind of like putting a microphone up to your larynx, yeah. um, but it can it can take very very small vibrations from the, from what in some cases was somebody's larynx and and you know, create speech out of them. So anyway, so that's the upper airway. The lower airway down here is the trachea. So this part you can actually feel from the outside. If you run your finger down the front of your neck, you can feel the bump, that's your larynx. So right where the bump is here, that's where your voice box is located, your vocal cords are in there. And then right below that, you can feel these little rings. Bump, 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 bump. You can feel the little rings in the front. Those rings of cartilage are holding your trachea open. So that's, that's these rings right here. And so unlike your esophagus, your trachea is always held open. 
okay? It always sits open like this. It doesn't collapse when you're not breathing. It's always open. Yes? Is it like bone? It, it, so the question was, what is it made out of? It's cartilage. It's cartilaginous rings. Wait, so I mean, isn't that what's made up in the nose? Yes. It's, it's, made out of, it's made out of the same structures as what you would find, like your, the bridge of your nose and stuff like that is made out of cartilage. If you break the cartilaginous rings, collapse your, your windpipe. So that does happen to people. That it can get broken uh, and you can potentially suffocate. Um, ideally, you, could, you would get that person ventilated. Uh, in other words, you would artificially place a tube through to allow them to breathe. But it is possible to crush your trachea. Uh, it does heal. It does heal. Yep. But you do have to, in order to allow them to heal, you do have to kind of hold it open so yeah, that they can continue yeah. breathing. Yeah, for a little bit until it heals. Anyway, and then this comes down to a little bifurcation down here. A bifurcation is a split into two, okay, which are called your bronchi. Your bronchi, your two bronchi are right at the armpit level. So if you're wondering how low that is on your body, if you just go check out your two armpits, and then kind of come straight into the center, that's where it splits into your two lungs, right at that level right there. So that's your bronchi. And then the bronchi splits into even smaller little tubes. Those are called bronchioles. And then the bronchioles split and split and split. And then eventually when you get to the end of the line, the bronchioles end in these little tiny sacs. So you can see the bronchioles right there go into these little sacs. And if you look inside the sacs, that is the actual alveoli, the place where there's that tiny thin membrane and gas can get exchanged from your lungs into your blood or from your blood into your lungs. Because if we go even smaller, you can see that they all have a ton of tiny little blood vessels running around them. And so that allows gas exchange to occur between the air outside and your blood. So those are the alveoli at the end of the line. Those structures, you need to know, okay? Those are the basic structures of the respiratory system. You should know what those structures are. One other thing I want to mention, and this came up in the reading yesterday as well, is that the lower respiratory tract has a, a secondary feature to it that's really cool. All of the cells that are in the bronchioles, which are these little passages down here, and your trachea, if you were to zoom in on these, if you were to take a look at these, you would see that the cells that line it have little hairs growing on them. So those little hairs are called cilia. And that, that type of tissue is called ciliated epithelium. And the cool thing about that is if you get particles of junk basically in there, dust, dirt, whatever, whatever you happen to aspirate into your respiratory system, those little hairs can grab that junk and they can actually move it step by step. They can push it back up from inside of your lungs all the way up your trachea, all the way through your larynx and back to your, um, basically your epiglottis up here so that you can swallow them down into your digestive tract. So they have a cleaning mechanism, which is really cool. It's these little hairs that are constantly moving small particles back up your respiratory system so that you can remove them. Cool system, really useful. Uh, it's, it's like a little self-cleaning mechanism, which is awesome. Um, and so th that is crucial in uh, keeping your system clean. There's also a thin lining on here, just a little lining of mucus goo basically and the purpose of the goo is it's just it's like flypaper it's just like a sticky um place so you can stick dust and particles onto it so that they don't get pulled down into your alveoli where you don't want dust is down in here in your gas exchange mechanism because once you get particles and dust starting to get in there you are inhibiting gas exchange. You're preventing your blood from getting oxygen. So you don't want particles to make it down to the alveoli. That would be the worst case scenario. In, when we talk about some of these respiratory illnesses, we're going to talk about what happens when you get stuff in there. Okay, emphysema is one of those things, but we're gonna, we'll talk about that in a bit. Any questions about the anatomy of the respiratory system? Like what are these structures doing before we move on? Give people at home a second here. 
Sorry, I'm doing a lot of talking today. This is more talky day than normal. There's less in the afternoon or in the second half. I should probably name this. These little things are called cilia. The questions? Yeah. So that's the basic anatomy. Those are the parts. Last thing I'm going to talk about. Oh, we mentioned, we mentioned this already here. Oh, I forgot I had this later in my note. Darn. So we mentioned this already, this idea of gas exchange. So gas exchange relies on this. They go all the way up, Brody, through the lower part of the respiratory tract. Yep, all, basically all the way up until where you would swallow. So up, up the epiglottis, through, like, through the glottal region, all, everything is ciliated sort of until this area right here where you can swallow stuff down. Above, above that, the cilia are not there, but um, pretty much any, anywhere that's exclusively for gas to move through is ciliated. So gas exchange relies on diffusion. We mentioned this already. So this entire process is reliant on high things moving from high concentration to low concentration. There's always a higher concentration of oxygen in the lung, in the alveoli. Is this going to work? Why are you not working? No, not working. No, working? <laughs> Sometimes this software is, drives me nuts. Now, when I say always, that means always as long as you're alive. If you stop breathing, then this is not true anymore. Then there isn't a higher concentration in the alveoli. But as long as you're alive and breathing, um, you're going to have a higher oxygen concentration in your alveoli. So oxygen is always going to go from the alveoli into your blood. Let's just give thing giving us a turn time from the alveoli. To the blood. This is just what we were talking about earlier. And there's always higher carbon dioxide concentration in the blood because your cells are making the carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is always going to move, diffuse from the blood into the lungs. To the wow, I'm really having trouble with this thing today. Blood to the lungs to the alveoli. Okay, the last thing that we're going to talk about this morning, I realize I've been talking for a long time here, is the idea of how you actually breathe. What is the mechanics involved in breathing? So, firstly, when you breathe in. So let's, let's just do it together right now. <laughs> Experience it together. Okay, when you breathe in, that is an active process. You had to expend energy to breathe in. And you may have noticed it. You, you had to pull. You had to pull the air in. Even when you're just breathing at rest, breathing at a natural rate, a natural amount, you still have to pull air in when you're breathing. So, first of all, inhalation is an active process. I'm just going to write this down at the top here. Inhalation is just breathing in. So active process just means that it uses energy. So the reason that it uses energy is because 
when you do it, you're essentially blowing up a balloon. <laughs> Your lungs are elastic. Uh, previously, I used to bring in a pair of lungs from a cow. Um, cow? Yeah. The real one. Yeah. Yeah, and then inflate it. Um, I actually had trouble getting a hold of um, a pluck, which is the respiratory tract of a cow. Um, the butcher that I normally get it from isn't currently doing those things, so I, I, I wasn't sure where to get an alternate, so I, I couldn't bring it in today, but they're really cool. Um, anyway, it's a balloon. <laughs> so in order to get stuff in, it's an elastic tissue, the lungs, so in order to get air in, you have to expend energy to inflate the balloon. But the lungs have no muscle tissue in them themselves. They're literally just a balloon. So in order to get the air in, you have to pull on the lungs to open them up. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just take one second here. Give me a second, home guys. Uh, I'm gonna grab my little uh, lung um, demonstration thing. Sorry for the delay, guys. I don't know where the lungs are. <laughs> I'm the lungs. We're, we're just gonna break here for lunch, um, and I'm gonna see, investigate, and see if I can find our lungs. Ready? Hey guys. Oh, awesome. Um, if you wouldn't mind, guys, you could just again let me know if you're present in the chat. So just here or present. You can check uh, afternoon attendance. And then we'll pick up where we left off. So we're going to be an exam. No. I mentioned that just before the break there. There, there isn't going to be an exam. Oh, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned that to everybody at home. Uh, the, there is not going to be an exam. So those exam days are going to be used for some type of summative assessment. But um, it's probably going to be sort of an open book kind of thing. Um, it's, it's definitely not going to be an exam. So. I'll give you more details when I figure that out, but it's 100% term mark. What's that? Well, I might do it as a bonus assignment. So I'm still kind of figuring that out. I need to check with the department too and figure out like what we're doing as a department, but I, for sure there's no exam. So. So that means that we won't even take the letters That I don't know. The, the government hasn't made a determination on that yet, so I. I mean, I can't really. Say, I have no idea, but I, I personally think it's unlikely. But I don't, I don't know that for a fact. So I don't know. I think it's unlikely, but I don't know. I don't get why they make me do attendance twice a day. It's like it's not like you guys are gonna leave. You were kind of nice to me though. I remember I had an I'm just saying grade nine. You know how you're supposed to leave that three people up? He's here. Cool. Okay, awesome. Okay, I'm going to pick up where I left off, guys. So, we were looking at 
the actual mechanics of breathing. How do you get the air in there? So I found my lungs. Here they are. So just like your lungs, these lungs are just a essentially balloon, okay? They're a piece of elastic material. There is no muscle in your lungs themselves. So in order for you to breathe in, to inhale, you got to pull on the bottom of your thoracic cavity, your chest cavity, and create negative pressure in the region in between. Okay, so there's a cavity under, um, your lungs are sitting in your thoracic cavity here. And when you pull down on your diaphragm at the bottom, let's see if I can show this on the camera really well here, it's going to create negative pressure, which uh, pulls air in through your trachea and inflates your lungs. And then when you exhale, basically what you're doing is relaxing that muscle and letting the balloons deflate. Oh. oh, that's unfortunate. Holy Did it spill a lot? Yeah. Uh, oh, I'll just, just, just close it up for now. Sorry, I'll have to look at that later. Okay, so every time you flex your diaphragm, you're going to get your lungs inflating, and then when you relax, they're going to deflate. So the active process is actually pulling down on your diaphragm to get the lungs to inflate. The other thing to note about this is that if you are to if you were to put a hole in this cavity, for example, like if you were to get stabbed or something like that, or get in a car accident and have something pierce the cavity, that's like breaking this seal at the top. So if you break the seal at the top so that there's no seal inside your thoracic cavity, and you try and use your diaphragm, you'll notice it doesn't do anything. Okay. So that causes your lungs to collapse if you break a hole in your thoracic cavity. There are certain types of bandages if you've taken first aid that teach you how to do make a little bandage to cover up that hole and turn it into a little vent to try and fix this problem. And they also have to fix it in hospital. Um, so when you go to the hospital, they can potentially fix that. But it does make it extremely difficult for you to breathe because you can't create this negative pressure that actually inflates your lungs. So it's kind of cool that even without having any uh, muscle in your lungs at all, uh, they will just, oh, yeah. they can um, pull air into them. So inhalation occurs when you contract your diaphragm muscle. Whoop, that's a terrible spelling. Contract your So again, if you look at the, uh, the diagram right here, if you pull this wall, this is your diaphragm at the bottom here, if you pull that muscle down by flexing it, it creates negative pressure in your lungs or low pressure. So that creates a low pressure area in your lungs. If you have low pressure in your lungs and high pressure outside your lungs. You guys remember this from uh, diffusion? So what happens if you, if you have a high pressure area and a low pressure area? High goes to low. Okay, All, high always goes to low. So if you create low pressure in your lungs, then the high pressure air outside is going to get forced into your lungs. That's the principle of diffusion. Okay, It's exactly the same. So things flow from high pressure to low pressure. The opposite is true when you exhale. But the difference here is that exhalation is a passive process. So when you exhale, you're actually just relaxing your diaphragm. So exhalation, I'm going to write just above here that this is a passive process. Passive just means no energy. You don't need to expend energy to breathe out. If you've ever seen uh, ventilation systems in the hospital, you might have seen that some of them are just positive pressure systems. There's different kinds of ventilation systems, but some of them are just pushing air in because the out part is you. You can, you can usually do the out part 
it's getting stuff in that is usually the difficult part. So often that they're only pushing stuff in and allowing you to exhale naturally. Okay, so exhalation occurs when you relax the diaphragm. Hmm? What causes you like not, not be able to like actually inhale the air or like the oxygen? Um, well, one of the things could be that you could have a paralyzed diaphragm for whatever reason. So there are drugs that cause paralysis to your diaphragm. There are various uh, chemicals that can potentially cause paralysis of your diaphragm, like uh, botul botulism is a good example. So if you have botulinum poisoning, I think somebody in here did a project on botulism. Is there somebody in here? Maybe somebody at home. I definitely read a botulism project. I can't remember who it was. But anyway, when you get botulism poisoning, it paralyzes your uh, your diaphragm muscles so that you can't inhale. That That's how it could potentially kill you. It might be some from the other, like the cohort. It must be some from the other cohort then, yeah. Because I definitely, I definitely saw one. Yeah. You relax the diaphragm. Yeah. So it's kind of like a balloon. The lungs are naturally elastic, so they push the air out of them, basically. So this is the exact opposite situation. Here, when you relax the diaphragm and it pushes back up again, you're going to end up now with a high pressure area in the lungs and a low pressure area outside the lungs. And just like before, things are always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. So that's going to cause a movement of gas out. Things go from high to low. So I, sh I should mention that in general, exhalation is a passive process. You're just letting the balloon deflate. However, you can constrict the muscles in your ribs, your intercostal muscles, and you can use that to force air quickly out of your lungs. You've probably you've done this before. When you blow out, when you when you forcefully exhale, you are using your intercostal muscles, the muscles in between your ribs, to push your chest cavity in to increase the amount of positive pressure to exhale faster. So you, you can you can make exhalation uh, uh, an active process. You can actively exhale, but in general, when you're just breathing at rest and even at exercise, typically you are actually just passively letting air escape. You're not really pushing it out. Any questions about like the actual mechanics of what's going on in the breathing now? Okay, so that's the ventilation system. That's how to get stuff in and get stuff out. So in very quick summary here, we've sort of talked about three aspects of respiration here. We've talked about why you're doing it. So what do you need the oxygen for? That's in order to produce ATP, okay, for cellular respiration. We've talked about the structures that are involved. Okay, including why gas is flowing in the direction that it's flowing. And then lastly, we're talking about how you physically do it. So what do you have to do in order to get air in and get air out? So there are three basic aspects of the respiratory system here. Okay, the last thing that we're going to talk about now is I'm going to go through some respiratory illnesses. I think this is relatively short. I've got a little presentation I'm going to go through just like I did with the digestive system. This one's quite a bit shorter than the digestive system one, though. Uh, I posted the presentation as well, so if you guys need uh, to look, go back and look at it, it's, it's there for your perusal. Um, so I'm just going to switch to it right now. But for each of these, what you're looking for, again, just like before, is what's the cause? So what is causing this particular illness or uh, impairment of the respiratory system? Uh, what are the symptoms? So how, how do you know when you have that thing? And then lastly, how would you treat it, okay? You don't need to write down stuff on the slides word for word, not at all, okay? This is just a basic summary. You can just put a one phrase summary of what's up there, okay? Have a look at what it says or listen, and then put down a one phrase summary for each of these things. You don't need to, you definitely don't need to include everything that's on the slides, okay? All right. Let's find this here. saying that presentation here. All right, here we go.
Okay, so we mentioned this already here. The basic idea, you're breathing about 10 to 14 times a minute, in and out, maybe 20,000 times a day. And in total, you're inhaling about 35 pounds of air, okay, over the course of the day. Yeah, air doesn't weigh very much, but or doesn't have a lot of mass. But obviously, if you're breathing 20,000 times, you're going to pull a significant amount of mass of air in and out over the course of the day. There are a lot, there's lots of stuff in the air that you're breathing in that you probably don't want to bring into your lungs. There's nitrous oxides, there's sulfur oxides, there's ozone, there's dust, there's other types of particulate matter in there, harmful chemicals potentially that you could be inhaling. So all of these things could potentially contribute to some type of impairment of your respiratory system if you inhale them. I mean, I guess you guys are wearing masks technically right now. I don't plan on wearing this for the rest of my life. So we are going to be inhaling some types of something into our lungs over the course of our lives. Um, so let's let's talk about some of those. We, we already went through the um, anatomy here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the anatomy. But I am going to start here by discussing lower respiratory tract disorders. So these are disorders basically from the trachea down, okay? And then I'm going to talk about some upper respiratory tract ones as well. So the three that we're going to discuss here are pneumonia, uh, uh, asbestosis, and pulmonary tuberculosis. So let's start with emphysema. Where the note that goes along with this? Yeah. It's the same document that you were using this morning. This is just like the next page in the document from the note. I put it all together as one document. Like this? That's the one. Yep. Yeah. So we're. That's right. So you're you're adding to that now. So we are first going to talk about emphysema, which is right there. The causes, the symptoms, and the treatment of emphysema they go right there. So we're just going to look at your screen for it. You can look here. You can listen. You're going to summarize in a phrase. No, because I thought we had that thing too. This is posted. So if you if you want to look at it, you can. Okay, fair enough. It is posted though, if you'd like it. Okay, so what is emphysema? It, basically, it's when you have damaged your alveoli, okay? So remember the alveoli are that thin single uh, cell layer membrane in those little clusters of spheres where the gas exchange actually happens. And because they get damaged, they stop being elastic. They get kind of scarred over top. Um, and then so you just lose your ability to exchange gas over those particular alveoli. Okay, it, it's, it's like permanent scarring of your alveoli. So, um, so it says it's called small airway collapse. Small airway collapse just means that like the uh, alveoli and the um, bronchioles, the tubes that are leading to those alveoli, basically get cut off. So they're no longer functional. You get a little bit of air that gets permanently trapped in those areas of the lungs. They don't get ventilated frequently. And obviously, um, you can get cell death when, they, when tissue doesn't get oxygenated. Um, so what's the cause of emphysema? Chemical exposure. So it's, ex it's exposure to some type of lung tissue damaging chemical. Far and away, the most common thing is cigarette smoke. So like 95% of cases of emphysema are caused by cigarette smoke. A few are caused by occupational exposure to various chemicals. You can also get emphysema from breathing in hot gas particles if you're like in a fire or something like that. But typically it's from inhaling cigarette smoke. So cigarette smoke is mostly what causes people to get emphysema. And so what do you get when you get emphysema? You get cough, uh, shortness of breath. It's difficult to catch your breath. You have difficulty exhaling because you sort of get these areas in your lungs where there's like air that gets trapped and so you can't fully exhale. Um, because you're not putting enough oxygen into your blood because you've kind of removed the surface where you're getting oxygen into your blood, you end up getting uh, weak, you can get lightheaded. Uh, it causes, eventually starts causing damage to your other tissues because you just don't get enough oxygen into your blood. So you get uh, heart damage, you can get heart failure from having uh, not enough oxygenation of your heart tissue. Um, it can cause swelling and edema in your body, so water to um, pool, especially in the lung tissue. So you can get edema in the lungs. That's just water pooling in the lungs. And then eventually it causes respiratory failure. So respiratory failure is when your lungs essentially can't diffuse enough gas into your blood to keep you alive. 
So uh, that is the same thing that people die of when they have really bad COVID. So respiratory failures or, or the flu. So that's when, when people die from the flu, they're dying from respiratory failure, which is that they can't get enough oxygen across uh, the alveolar membrane into their blood. Um, and like I, like I mentioned, uh, so this is mostly caused by smoking. There are places in the world where this is heavily contributed to um, from like pollution as well. So uh, if you live in an area of the world where there's really high percentages of particulate matter in the air, uh, a lot of places in India, uh, there are a number of cities in China that have very high daily um, particulate matter in their pollution. Um, so that can contribute potentially to uh, emphysema as well. Those areas of the world also have very high smoking rates, so those are significant contributors. Okay, how do you treat it? This one is tough because you've permanently damaged the alveoli. They will not heal. So when you get emphysema, that's permanent. That's permanent scar tissue that you've got in your lungs. You can give people oxygen, so you can put them on 100% oxygen. Right now you're breathing in about 20% from the atmosphere. So you can give people 100% oxygen. That increases how much oxygen is going to diffuse across the membrane into the blood. Uh, but there's really nothing you can do to get rid of the scar tissue. So if somebody's already on 100% oxygen and they still can't perfuse enough into your blood, into their blood, then we're kind of getting into the end of the line for people at that point. So um, emphysema can make life very difficult for people. Um, if you can imagine that at rest, just when you're just sitting there, if you're having difficulty getting enough oxygen into your blood, if you have to do anything like climb stairs or walk or really anything, uh, that's going to make your life very difficult because that increases how much oxygen you need by a lot um, and so that you probably won't be able to do those things anymore. You just simply can't breathe enough. So um, here, here's a, an example of um, here's a little diagram of somebody with um, emphysema damage to their lungs. Essentially, the inner tissues of the uh, alveoli are gone and it doesn't allow gas exchange any longer. On the right there is a CT scan of somebody who has uh, emphysema. That person has very significant emphysema um, in their right lung. Uh, it's, the, it's the black area of their lung right there. So the black area, you can see like you can't see the actual alveolar tissue anymore. It just looks like a, like a solid clump. And so that's, that part of your lung is no longer functional. That person has like in their right lung, they might have like 30% uh, non-functional lung tissue. So that's, that's very significant. What, I know the black stuff is emphysema, but what is it? Like, things like that, like what is emphysema? The alveoli are scarred over. So also it's just like... They basically, they, they, don't, op they don't sit open anymore. They're, they're, they're kind of mushed and... Uh, okay, okay, there's no gas exchange happening there. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yes? Is this mainly caused by... Smoke? Almost exclusively, yeah. Can it be like other kinds of smoke as well? Like well, any, any type of smoke potentially causes this. Vaping is in one of those weird areas where we don't really know a lot about the long-term health effects from vaping. They're certainly not as bad as smoking. I think we can probably say that um, unequivocally, like that the damage is not as bad. But is there no damage? I don't know that. And we don't have a lot of long-term data on vaping, so I don't know about that in particular. Would like smoking marijuana do the same thing? It, it, it does the same damage, yeah. So, it, it, oh, by the way, it also does the same damage if you're living in a, in a developing country where you cook over a wooden fire. People get the exact same type of emphysema from that type of smoke. It's really when you're burning anything and inhaling it. So would like firefighters get that too? They do if they're, if they're not wearing safety equipment. And they do have a much higher incidence of emphysema in the population. Would you get that from like a campfire? If you were exposed to it constantly. Yeah. So if you're cooking over a campfire daily, eventually you're going to start developing damage from inhaling the smoke all the time. Yes, and that does happen for cook fires in the developing world. Okay. Uh, oh, and here's an example of, here you can see the emphysemal tissue a little bit better in this lung. So this person has emphysema as well. I don't know if you guys can see that on the screen there. So there's the little black regions there, are areas essentially where the, the alveolar tissue is dead. So it's, it's scarred over because of the, um, this, is, this is from, this is a smoker's lung, so. Okay, so that's emphysema. Um, let's talk about asthma. Um, Asthma is a uh, 
breathing problem that is caused by constriction of your bronchioles. So I'm going to jump back really quickly here to um, this presentation because I want to talk about really quickly about these bronchioles. So these tubes in your lungs, these ones right here that branch into smaller and smaller tubes, they have muscle around them. Okay, little bands of muscle. And that muscle is not really functional any longer. Previously, in some other previous evolutionary iteration of humans, or even perhaps before we were humans, um, it's possible that those that the mus the muscle around the bronchioles was useful. Uh, it may have prevented us from, for example, inhaling smoke um, around early campfires or um, uh, there, there are a bunch of theories, uh, potentially prevented people from drowning because they constrict uh, if you're underwater. Uh, potentially, they can. Um, so, but they don't really have a function for humans any longer, this, this muscle. In people with asthma, you can trigger a constriction of this, this muscle around the alveoli, and it actually blocks off air from getting into your lungs. So, it... It is, it is your own muscle that's constricting around the, your bronchioles and cutting off air supply to your lungs. That, that's what's happening. Um, it is uh, partially genetic, so there are some genetic contributing factors to people that have asthma, but there are also environmental factors that influence people getting asthma as well. It has to do with environmental exposure when you're very young, potentially. Um, young people, very young children that are never exposed to bacteria, people that keep like a highly sterile environment, tend to get asthma more. Uh, we don't really 100% know the reason why, but it may have something to do with the fact that, we, that we're not training their immune systems to understand what is and is not a bad germ when children are young. And so if they have no exposure to germs, they may provoke an inappropriate immune response to just normal allergens that are in the air, which can potentially trigger an asthma attack. Uh, so that, that's, that's a component of it. Um, so it, I mentioned on this slide here that asthma rates seem to be going up significantly in the population. They're going up a lot more than, the, than, than we can really explain from pollution factors. If you look at air pollution, the amount of particulate matter, the amount of little specks of things that are in the air, there's actually less in the air now than there was 30 years ago. So we're, we're better at preventing that stuff from getting into the air at an industrial level. At least, at least in North America, we are, again, there are issues with this in the developing world and all over the world. Um, but in general here, air quality is better. But asthma rates have actually gone up, and that probably is related to that immune response issue with young people. But we're not 100% sure on the cause behind that. Uh, anyway, you can, asthma attracts can be triggered by all kinds of things. Stress, uh, you could, it could be inhalation of allergens, often that's a trigger for people. Uh, pollution can be a trigger. Uh, if you get an infection in your lungs, that could be a trigger. It can be, be triggered by emotional stress. Um, and what, what you experience is uh, an inability to breathe, okay? So it's difficult to inhale because you have constriction of your bronchioles, and so you have difficulty inhaling, and you feel shortness of breath. Um, sometimes those symptoms resolve when people go unconscious but not always. So sometimes severe asthma attacks, people don't have um, a relaxation of those bronchial muscles when they become unconscious, which can be quite dangerous. Um, obviously, they could, they could potentially be fatal. So how do you treat it? Mostly, uh, in the short term, you give people inhaled muscle relaxants. So people inhale drugs that relax the muscles uh, around the bronchioles and allow them to open back up again. Um, that would be the treatment that you would give in the moment. Long term, you can give people steroid treatment. That also comes in the form of an inhaler. Uh, and the steroids tend to prevent those muscles from contracting in the first place. So that's a long term treatment that makes them less sensitive over time to, um, to being triggered. Uh, and often uh, people with severe asthma are treated with both. Question? Uh, I used to have it. Uh, mm -hmm. Like in, in my home country, mm -hmm. now I have like big oxygen tanks for it. Oh, interesting. So you see, so you oh, you also had supplementary oxygen treatment. Okay, so then so that's probably a possibility too, especially if you're having severe asthma attacks. That's interesting. Yeah, it, have like, 
Don't they do? Don't they have like side effects? They do. Yep. Um, they can be immune system inhibiting in this case. Are you, you think about anabolic steroids or steroid treatments in yeah, general? Didn't they feel like when you do steroids and stuff, they, they can have like all these bad side effects on your body? Like, so, so that be the same thing, I think? the question here was um, are there side effects associated with using steroids? So, I think you're thinking about anabolic steroids. So, anabolic steroids are a specific type of steroid that causes muscle growth or tissue growth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there are side effects using anabolic steroids as well. They are immune system inhibitors. Uh, they can potentially uh, increase your chances of getting a bunch of different types of cancers. They can damage your circulatory system, uh, if you're especially if you're taking them for a, a long term. Um, these types of steroids don't work exactly the same as anabolic steroids do, but they um, they do inhibit your immune system and they do have other side effects. Yeah, so it's not side effect free. But, uh, but the treatments are fairly effective. They, often, they're used intentionally to inhibit an immune response. So in this case, in the lungs, they're preventing your lungs from being triggered by thinking that there is a threat of some kind of bacteria or whatever and keeping them from reacting with an immune response. This is, uh, I don't know if you guys follow the news. So like recently, Donald Trump got COVID. And one of the things that he was treated with was a steroid in his lungs because the immune response to COVID is one of the things that makes people very ill. So you can give people uh, inhaled steroids that restricts the immune response in the lungs and prevents them from getting all inflamed, which makes it much worse. It's very similar in this case. Okay. Wait, what do you say this? Uh, you can't breathe. <laughs> so you get an asthma attack, uh, you experience severe, moderate to severe shortness of breath. In response to various triggers. No problem. So here's just an example right here of that muscle on the outside of the bronchiole constricting and obviously creating a really, really tight, tiny airway, which is difficult to breathe through. Was, um, Ali, was your um, asthma triggered by pollution? Or what was it, what was it, what was your trigger? Uh, oh, interesting, interesting, and you grew out of it. So that's, that, that's possible too, so some people just grow out of it as they get older. That's l lucky for you, that's good. So we already talked about this, potential triggers, allergens, mold. Okay, let's talk about bronchitis. Is it, this is the next one on the sheet, right? Yeah. So any kind of itis, and you'll see, you'll see lots of itises in medicine. An itis is just an inflammation. It's inflamed, it's, there's a lot of extra blood flow going to it, and it's becoming engorged with blood, there's an immune response. So, for example, if you have pancreatitis, or hepatitis, or um, any, anyway, any itis. <laughs> uh, that just means inflammation of whatever. Hold on, Nadia, we'll get there. Um, so the um, bronchitis specifically is when you get an irritation and inflammation of your bronchioles. And just like with the um, asthma attack, where the inflammation is going to make it more difficult to breathe, obviously you're going to have that swelling that's happening inside of your bronchioles, the same thing is happening in bronchitis. It's not quite as severe as asthma usually but you are experiencing swelling in your bronchioles, which is making it difficult for you to breathe. Uh, it also increases the amount of mucus that's being produced in your bronchioles. And so when you increase that mucus, that's like goo in your, in your bronchioles that you have to remove. So you normally get a productive cough with bronchitis. A productive cough is a cough that actually coughs up stuff. So if you're coughing up stuff, you probably have some type of inflammation of your bronchioles, bronchitis. So, what causes bronchitis? Um, infection is probably the most common. Um, you can get bronchitis from uh, bacterial or, or viral infection of the lung. Uh, pretty much any bacterial or viral infection of the lung is going to cause bronchitis of some kind. Question? I thought bronchitis was the one where you cough up blood. Uh, that's severe bronchitis. Oh. So, if you're coughing so much that you're actually tearing the lining, the epithelial layer of your bronchioles, and blood is coming out, uh, that can happen. Yeah, yeah, I was just kind of like confused. That, no, but that absolutely can happen. So you can have a productive like blood in your sputum and your cough up from 
from bronchitis. But that, that's quite, it's, it's pretty bad at that point. Yeah. But, uh, but absolutely, that is physically possible. Um, so this is the type of uh, thing that you can diagnose through just listening to people breathe. So if you get the stethoscope on the lungs and you listen to someone breathe, you can hear wheezing. <laughs> Um, because of the constriction of airflow, it makes a sound, and you can also hear rattling. So it's like a gurgling sound that you hear when you listen to people breathing, and that rattling is the mucus kind of moving around inside of your lungs as you're trying to breathe through it. It's kind of like bubbling around uh, in your bronchioles while you're breathing. So um, if you've got that rattling sound, if you're wheezing, if you're experiencing shortness of breath, if you're coughing up stuff, then you probably have bronchitis. And like I said, bronchitis can be caused by all kinds of things. There's genetic illnesses that cause bronchitis as well as a side effect. Um, did we do that project in here, genetic illness? That was the last unit, right? Did anybody have that as, a, as, a, as part of their genetic illness, uh, bronchitis? No. No? Just curious. I, was, I, I haven't marked all of them yet, so I wasn't sure. Anyway, so you'll notice here, this looks very similar to the asthma attack, except the difference is that this is not caused by the muscle layer. So the muscle layer, which is this layer right here on the outside, is not constricted in the case of bronchitis. It's relaxed. And the part that's inflamed is actually the part right underneath the epithelial layer. So that's where there's an immune response happening. And it, but it, I mean, the effect is the same. The airway is smaller, and there's a mucus buildup on the inside of the, of the uh, epithelium. You can use the same types of treatments often as you do for asthma. So you can use a muscle relaxants as an inhaler. You can also use uh, steroids. But in general, for bronchitis, you want to treat what's causing the bronchitis. So if it's a bacterial infection, you want to give people antibiotics to get rid of the bacteria. If it is an allergic reaction, you try and remove the allergen. Um, if it's genetic, you, should, you try and treat the genetic disorder that is causing the bronchitis. Um, if it's damage to the lungs, do from like, for example, like you breathe in some, too much smoke or something like that and you got bronchitis, then you want to give just people time to heal. So do you think I should just try to treat whatever is causing it? You want to treat the root cause of the bronchitis, yeah. It's usually um, antibiotics and steroids. Mm -hmm. Okay to move on? Yep. Okay. Pneumonia. Is this on your sheet? Do you guys have pneumonia in there? Yeah. You do. Okay. So pneumonia, oddly spelled with a P at the beginning, is when you get inflammation of your alveoli. So now we're not talking about bronchitis, which is in the bronchioles. Now we're talking about inflammation of the little sacs at the end of the alveoli. And when that inflammation gets really bad, the alveoli tend to fill up with liquid. They fill up with fluid. So sometimes when you have bronchitis, if it's untreated, it can proceed into pneumonia. Pneumonia is a lot worse than bronchitis. Bronchitis is a productive cough. You guys have probably had that many times in your life. It's unlikely that you've had pneumonia. You may have had pneumonia before, but it's unlikely because pneumonia can be very dangerous. You can die from pneumonia. Um, so typically it's caused by an infection. It's usually caused by an infection. There is a class of bacteria called pneumoniaes that are, uh, that commonly cause pneumonia in humans, but there are lots of other things that could potentially cause it. There's viral infections and all different, all different kinds of things. Parasites. Um, if you do damage your, your, again, damage your lungs with, uh, for example, you're in a fire and you inhale hot gas in a fire, you can potentially cause pneumonia. Um, if you, there are certain types of chemicals that if you inhale them, they can potentially cause pneumonia. So those are all potential factors. The symptoms are similar to bronchitis in that you have a cough, usually a productive cough. You have chest pain, but it's almost always also associated with fever and severe difficulty breathing. So once you start building up fluid in your alveoli, remember you can't perfuse gas into your blood. And so you're really, really going to have trouble breathing at this point. It's gonna cause your blood oxygen level to go down. Uh, so, so in this case, you are going to have to treat this person by giving them oxygen if they have pneumonia. They don't have the ability to perfuse enough oxygen into their blood because their alveoli have liquid in them. 
And the second part of that is you have to get rid of whatever is causing pneumonia. It's usually a bacterial infection, in which case you treat them with antibiotics. Often they give you antibiotics anyway, just in case you get a bacterial infection while you have liquid in there. So even if it's caused by a burn or something like that, they'll give you preventative antibiotics to make sure you don't get a bacterial infection. Yes? That is a great question. Give me one sec. I will give you an answer. Uh, so there are three parasites that are typically associated with getting pneumonia. They're called Ascaris, Schistosoma, and Toxoplasmus, uh, Toxoplasma gondii. Okay, those are the three parasites. But parasitic, um, parasitic pneumonia is very uncommon. It usually only happens to people that have really, really compromised immune systems. They have HIV, AIDS or they're taking a drug or something that's compromising their immune system, or they're elderly. But it's quite rare to get um, pneumonia for that reason. Oh, Did you just find a picture? <laughs> I'm sure it's gross. I can't tell if it's When I was a kid, I always used to wonder why when people got pneumonia, why you couldn't just like, stand people on their heads and like just let the liquid run out <laughs> it seems like you would be able to or just like take a little hose and just like vacuum the lungs out you know like just get the liquid out of there but oh oh interesting it's um but you obviously can't do that because the alveoli are like i said like the size of a breadcrumb you have hundreds of thousands of them and so you can't get in there and, <laughs> and vacuum them out that's not actually possible to do yes How would you do that because i know in like car racing and stuff when they crash and they get like stuff in their lungs mm -hmm. they can like take a tube and like pull it out if they use like a similar process have you seen the movie rush no but now i'm really curious to see yeah, what that well, is he crashes and he has like a whole bunch of stuff in his lungs like a whole bunch of like liquids and gases and whatnot and they like stick a tube down the throat and like pull it out of the lungs i'm gonna look that up, look that up. i am gonna look that up They, you definitely can't treat pneumonia like that. I'm 100% sure of that. But but what are they using in car racing, though? <laughs> it was an older movie. Like new movie about Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna investigate this one. It's a good movie. Watch it. It's called Rush. Rush, yeah. Okay. With uh, Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go come back to this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look into that because that, that's that's very interesting. Um, sorry, Nadia, what what were you asking with the treatment for? For which one? For for pneumonia. Here you would use antibiotics as a treatment, yes, and people would be put on oxygen. Okay, tuberculosis, not super common in North America, but in lots of other places in the world, it's endemic. It's very common. Uh, tuberculosis is a bacterial illness. It's caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. That is the name of the bacteria that causes it. And, oh, sorry, the treatment for bronchitis um, would usually be antibiotics. Steroids as well are used to relieve some of the, uh, um, the inflammation caused by the bronchitis. Sorry, did someone have a question out there? Yes? Why didn't they give us that shot then? The tuberculosis shot? Yeah. Have you had a tuberculosis vaccine? No, when I lived in, uh, when I lived in California, they did I didn't even know there was a tuberculosis vaccine, but I'm going to investigate that, that right now. I didn't get tuberculosis. What's I, I, yeah, they gave me like a shot. Did this happen? Interesting. <laughs> not, not typically given in the U.S. or Canada, but it is common in other places. I haven't had TB vaccine. Yeah, sure I've had that, but it's, it's you probably have. You probably have. I, I would. I, it may even be given to people if you're traveling to an area where there's high incidence of tuberculosis. 
So like, for example, like India and Russia, it's very, it's much more common to get tuberculosis there than it is here. Um, if left untreated, it can potentially be fatal. So you can die from tuberculosis. The, the bacteria group together into little clumps called tuber, tuber, tubercules, tubercules. Uh, and those generally form in the lungs. So you get these little clumps of bacteria that form in your lungs and make it difficult for you to breathe. I think I have a picture on the next page. I'll show you what it looks like. Yeah, because yeah, I remember I had that vaccine. Interesting, interesting. I, I just looked it up. There is a vaccine available. I, I, I don't think it's given to the general population here because it's quite yeah, rare I, 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 like, here. Like, you know when you go to school and you have to sign up, you have to get like a yep. test. I have to put like, all the different things. Interesting. So that, you said in California, that's one yeah. of the that's standard. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um... Anyway, it, in, like I said, in general, it affects the lungs. However, you can get those tubercules, those little clumps of bacteria, all over. So there is, for example, um, versions of tuberculosis where they can grow into the brain, uh, other places in the body where they obviously can have severe um, side effects for people if you get that. Um, so far, tuberculosis is mostly treatable by antibiotics. So you can treat it with antibiotics. However, more recently, lots of drug-resistant TB is proliferating. Um, and so there are cases of tuberculosis that are extremely difficult to treat with antibiotics or are untreatable. That's like super TB, which we can't treat with antibiotics any longer. So there are versions of tuberculosis that we can't treat with antibiotics. Um, but in general, it can be treated with antibiotics. The antibiotics, by the way, you have to take for a long time. I think it's a two-month course or a three-month course. And you can't drink alcohol while you're taking tuberculosis um, treatment, which is one of those things. I had a number of friends in university that were uh, taking treatment for tuberculosis, so, and that was a concern of theirs anyway. Um, so what do you get with tuberculosis? Obviously, a cough. So this is tu tubercules that are forming in your lungs. It makes it difficult for you to breathe. You cough. Sometimes you get blood in your sputum. From the cough so that's one of the signs of tuberculosis if you're producing uh, sputum with blood in it uh, and there's often fever associated with this so it is an infection so it causes fever you get sweating at night sometimes weight loss is associated with it in the, in the long term so it takes quite a long time for a significant case of tb to develop and so you have to uh, really have it for quite a while untreated before it starts having some of these more significant symptoms you guys what what, oh, what what book is that? Is it the Glass Menagerie? Do you guys do that in class anymore? Don't do that one? In English class? You don't read that book? Glass Menagerie? No. You guys ever watch an old movie where they talk about people getting consumption? No. If you ever watch a period movie and they talk about people dying from consumption or so-and-so got consumption, that's 2TB. So it used to be called consumption. Um, and it's, call, it's called that because if, if you leave it untreated, eventually it causes significant weight loss and you kind of just waste away. You die from your tuberculosis infection for, uh, after, after a long time. Used to be hugely, hugely problematic um, until we started uh, more significantly vaccinating for TB. Uh, my, my, both of my parents have had the TB vaccine, but more recently we, we don't typically um, vaccinate for it anymore. That's cool that you have it. Um, but in general, it's just not that common. And so, I, you don't really need to vaccinate for it, at least here, at least here. There are definitely places in the world where you'd want to get a TB vaccine before you travel there. Mm -hmm. Used to be huge, hugely, hugely problematic, though. Did I... How old is this, uh, this uh, from the early 1900s. Encouraging people not to spit on the street, so you don't spread TB. Okay, last one. I think this is the last one. Is this the last one on your sheet, lung cancer? No. Do you guys have lung cancer on it? Yeah. I don't have it. Oh, it on. You guys don't have this one either? So this this is an extra. <laughs> I, I, I forgot to put this on the sheet. Um, so lung cancer, primarily caused by smoking. Um... About 70% of cases are caused by smoking. 30% of cases are caused by uh, environmental exposure. Um, can, you, can you get it from radiation? Lung cancer? Yeah. The, 
if you're inhaling a radioactive gas, yeah. so the most common one is radon. So I think about 20% of lung cancer cases are caused by people inhaling radon gas. It accumulates in your basement. So depending on where you live, it may be coming out of the ground where you live, or it may be coming out of your granite countertops. So there are granite countertops that produce radon gas, which eventually settles in your basement. It is a radioactive gas. If you inhale it over the long term, it can give you lung cancer. Uh, but by far and away, though, most cases of lung cancer are caused by smoking. So uh, lung cancer also, by the way, while it is not the most common cancer, it is by far the most deadly cancer. So the vast majority of people that die from cancer die from lung cancer, and it's mostly from smoking. You need a trigger warning for the next slide. Oh, yeah. I do. Sorry. Did you jump ahead already? No, I was just looking through. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you're right. Like like fair enough, fair enough. I'll, I'll mention it. Um, so the mortality rate is mostly because uh, with a lot of types of cancer, you can surgically remove it. But with the lungs, you kind of have to, you kind of need your lungs. So you can uh, take parts of the lung. You can take lobes of the lung. You can even take an entire lung. But you really can't take more than that. And even one lung, difficult to survive on a single lung. Um, you, you need to perfuse your blood with oxygen. So there's only so much you can remove. There's also a lot of blood supply to the lungs. So you can't just cut out small chunks of lung because it's too difficult to tie off all the little tiny blood vessels. There's only certain places where you can cut in the lung effectively. So removing a cancer from the lungs is extremely difficult. It also metastasizes quickly, so it spreads to other places in the body generally very quickly. So lung cancer is extremely difficult to treat. It's very painful because it prevents you from breathing. Um, it causes a persistent cough, bloody cough, uh, chest pain. Uh, and then it's obviously associated with bronchitis and pneumonia because it causes a bunch of inflammation in your lungs when you do get it. So it's, uh, it, it's quite, quite serious. Um, I mentioned asbestos on there. Is asbestos on your sheet? Okay, so I, that's why I put it on here. That's why I put it on here. So the end product of asbestos exposure is eventually lung cancer. So when you are exposed to asbestos, eventually asbestosis becomes lung cancer over time. I am going to talk about asbestos specifically in a second, but, but that, that's the reason that I put this on here is because eventually asbestosis will cause lung cancer. They have the same symptoms? Uh, yes, they do, actually. They do have the same symptoms. Um, you can, like I said, treat lung cancer with surgery, so you can remove parts of the lung. Um, not a lot of lung cancers are generally very operable. They don't respond to, typically very well to chemotherapy. So again, they're extremely difficult to treat. So even though they don't make up the majority of cancers in humans, they make up the vast majority of deaths by cancer So because they, they, they're so difficult to treat. Don't smoke. If, and if you pick up one thing out of this presentation, guys, Please don't smoke, okay? That causes most of the things in this presentation, okay? And they're, they're all horrible. Okay, I will give you a trigger warning. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, there's a picture on the next slide of somebody who's had lung cancer surgery. So there they are right there. They've had a lobectomy, which is part of the lobes of one of their lungs removed. And there, there, like I said, there are specific ways that you can cut up the lung to remove sections. You can't just cut it anywhere. So you can potentially remove a small mass if it's on the outside. Uh, you can remove an entire lobe. You can re remove an entire lung. And then there are also like partial lobectomies, more difficult to do. Yes? So the lung is literally like right in the back. Is there nothing blocking it? Uh, the ribs. you got to cut the rib there. Oh, so the rib is like all around it? Or like no, it's just right like... in the middle? And then it goes all the way connected? The ribs go all the way around. Yep, they're attached to the spine in the back too. What's that? You do. Yeah, you gotta cut them. It's just inside of the rib. Yep. They do. Yep. Sometimes they sometimes they, they surgically break them, and then they reset the rib, and then it'll just heal. It'll heal over. The bone heal? Yep, the bone will heal. Yep. See them like saw it. Uh, you can cut them. Yeah, there are there are different methods to get around them. What's that, sir? I think they can glue them, actually. Yeah. So I, I'm pretty sure that they glue them. They use surgical glue to put them back together. That's for the spine itself. Yeah. So they they'll use a metal brace for the spine. I don't think they do that for ribs, though. 
<laughs> the one we have left is not in the slideshow. Sorry, this one is not in the slideshow, Nadia, but this is the end product of asbestosis, which I'm going to talk about next. I'm not going to get into too much detail here, um, but lung cancer can metastasize. That is when it gets into the blood, it travels to another location in the body and forms a new tumor. Uh, here's an example of this. Here's a healthy lung on the left, and then the person on the right is a smoker and that has a number of uh, tumors in the lung that have been caused by the healthy lung. This is a normal lung. Wait, are those like real, like, yep. that's somebody dead though, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this person, these are both from dead people, yeah. But that's, nor that's normal lung tissue on the left, that's what lung tissue looks like. Uh, and then the lung on the right is a smoker's lung. It's not supposed to look like that, but yeah, that's a lifetime smoker, but that's somebody who's been smoking for their life. They, they also have lung cancer, so there are a number of tumors on that uh, image on the right. It's really significant. Again, if you take one thing away from this, don't smoke. I'm going to skip over this part right here. I'm going to jump over this. I, I don't want to I don't want to hit you over the head too much here with the smoke no smoking message. But one of the other things I just really quickly wanted to mention, and I realize this is not in your note, um, is that when you smoke, it also paralyzes those cilia that are on the inside of your trachea and your bronchioles, the cilia that clean your lungs. They get paralyzed by cigarette smoke. So when you smoke, you actually prevent uh, them from cleaning out your lungs regularly, which increases your chance of getting lung infections. So that, there's just a, like another um, significant effect there. Oh, that's an awesome picture. Uh, do, do you guys remember I talked about the little hairs that are on the surface of the of the trachea? Yeah. So that those are the hairs right there. That this is an electron microscope uh, photograph that's of one of the cells. So that's what they look like. Those are the cilia. Yeah. So they have little hairs that can slowly push. Wait, are those in your What's that? Yeah, they're on, they're lining your trachea and lining your bronchioles. Yep. And they. How do they get a microscope back? Uh, well, it uses electrons to scan the sample, so it, it's bouncing electrons off, and then the, when the electrons come back, it makes a picture from how they bounce back. Yeah, it is sick. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead here to, oh, oh, I forgot to put asbestosis in here. Okay, I'll just tell you about asbestosis, no problem. So asbestosis, which is on your, um, on your sheet, you guys have asbestos, right? Yeah. So the, the symptoms are exactly the same as the lung cancer symptoms, which is that it causes, uh, do I have them on here? Yeah, persistent cough, difficulty breathing, chest pain. Um, and what happens in the case of asbestosis, asbestos is a mineral. It's like a little tiny crystal. It's a little crystal particle that is microscopic. And when you inhale that little crystal, it gets wedged into your lung tissue because it's like a sharp pointy mineral. And those cilia can't remove the crystal. So the, the crystal ends up sitting on the side of your lung tissue and aggravating the cells underneath. It's constantly poking them. And so what you end up getting is a scar that forms underneath the asbestos. And then over time, because that cell is continuously being inflamed by that little particle, which you can't remove, eventually it causes abnormal growth of cells around, around the, the asbestos, which can become lung cancer in the long term. Yeah, um, there's also, uh, there's no cures for it, but it can, there's something that can uh, slow it down. So Lung cancer or asbestosis? asbestosis. So, uh, there's they, something that can slow it down to make the person live a little longer. They use steroid treatment, I think, to slow the inflammation process yeah. from it. So, so that, that is true. You can't remove the asbestos. It's, no, it's, it. it's so hard to get it out of there because it's, it, it's, it's like a burr. You know when you like go in the woods and you get like burrs on your pants? It's like the equivalent of that, but inside your lungs. Well, those things that, like, stick to yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah, they are annoying. Yeah, this is the the respiratory version of a burr. That's that's bad. So we don't use asbestos for anything in North America any longer. There are places in the world where it's used quite extensively, but we used to use it as a fire retardant. It doesn't catch fire. So, for example, this school used to have most of its insulation made out of asbestos. It's been removed subsequently, uh, but you'd be probably surprised to learn that 
in the science wing here, we only removed our asbestos two years ago. <laughs> so it was here until fairly recently. But keep in mind, it was above the ceiling and inaccessible. So it's not like it was just like in our face all the time. It, ha it has to be disturbed in order for you to so inhale it. someone hit the ceiling all the time? So it would be concerning. It would be concerning. We've had all of the asbestos removed at this point from the school. Now, I will mention that we do have asbestos in the school still. These floor tiles are made out of asbestos. But these floor tiles are not made out of um, particulate asbestos. In other words, when you disturb them, it doesn't go up into the air. It's, they stay as panels. And so these are not considered to be dangerous, but they are still made out of asbestos. So the reason they're used is because they're fireproof. So the floor is fireproof in here. Uh, we probably will have them replaced eventually, but it's, they're very expensive to replace, and they're not considered to be a health hazard. So they're not like it's high on somebody's priority list. But all the insulation has been removed, which is a plus. Okay, guys, uh, treatment of asbestosis, by the way, um, is there like, uh, as was mentioned here, there is a steroid treatment, but in general, there's really nothing that you can do. Okay, I'm gonna get the phone, give me one sec. Sure, we're actually just finished this thing here, so perfect. Thanks. All right, bye. Okay, guys. <laughs> That's all for this. Last thing. Last thing for you to do. <laughs> it just keeps going. This is the last thing for two weeks. If you're interested, watch this medical case study video. You don't really have to watch this, I guess, if you don't want to. But it's all about the, um, the person who accidentally aspirated, breathed in some Tide Pods, what happened to them, how they treated them in the hospital. It's kind of a cool video. If you're interested, it talks about a lot of the anatomy of the lung that we were just discussing together, which is why I put it in there. So if you're interested, I highly recommend it. Other than that, guys, this is the last time I'm going to see you for about two weeks. If you owe me anything. Two weeks? That's right. <laughs> what we do online, right? No. After a week. When you come back, you're going to come back so in two weeks. Two week, in two weeks. So two weeks, you don't do anything. For this course. Gym. Then we go online. No, we have gym for two weeks, bro. That's right. I won't see you in person for three oh, weeks. The, the cause for asbestos, Nadia, is inhaling asbestos. So if you inhale particles of asbestos, that's what causes that. Okay. Thanks, Theo. Now you got it right. Um, so I won't see you, like I said, for two weeks. If you owe me anything, guys, please, just one second. As soon as possible, if you could get that stuff to me, I would love to update your marks. Okay? If you have any problems, email me, but keep in mind that I'm teaching another class, so this class is not my first priority any longer. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to get into the virtual classroom, and I will say goodbye to you guys for a couple weeks. All right, have a good one.